Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's training, Treating Opiate Use Disorder in Nursing Facilities, hosted by the Center of Excellence for Behavioral Health in Nursing Facilities. I am Nikki Harris, Training and Education Lead for the Center of Excellence, and it is my pleasure to oversee the delivery of mental health and substance use disorder trainings to nursing facilities nationally at no cost. And now, I am happy to introduce both of our presenters for today. Dr. Swati Gar is the Medical Director of New Horizons Nursing Facilities with the Northeast Georgia Health Systems. She is also the CEO of Care Advances Through Technology, a technology innovation company. Dr. Gar has also consulted with post-acute long-term care companies on a variety of issues. Dr. Jen Azen is a general internist who has practiced in both the primary care and post-acute care settings. Her primary care practice is focused on medically complex and geriatric patients. She provides in-home visits to medically fragile patients in private homes, adult family homes, and assisted living. Dr. Azen currently works in post-acute care with Harborview Medical Center's Bed Readiness Program, where she cares for patients with socially complexity, including substance use disorders. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Gar and Dr. Azen to begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki, for that kind of introduction. So today is gonna be a power pack session. So we're gonna zip through these learning objectives. Essentially, we're gonna talk about how to practice opioid stewardship, we call it, um, to ensure that we are giving the pain medication to the right patients for the right indications for, for the right time um, in the right doses, okay? Um, and then we are gonna talk about, you know, how to evaluate the residents for opioid use disorder, like we talked about in um, um, practicing opioid stewardship, you want to make sure that you risk assess your patients before you start them on um, opioids, and then how to um, taper them safely from, um, uh, you know, from these opioids. So, Going right into it, we are we have a financial disclosure. <laughs> that one disclosure: my husband works for CVS Home Infusion and has employees own stock, but it is not directly related to this topic. <laughs> and uh, we uh, obviously have two doodles um, that um, we also put in the disclosures. I have no disclosure, so jumping right in. This is an actual patient, ninety-six year old lady who had a fall in the nursing home while transferring from chair to bed and hit her left shoulder. The x-ray did not show a fracture. Three days later, staff reported that she stopped getting out of bed and her appetite went steadily down. She was only eating 25% of the meals. Family meeting was hell and um, the son decided to treat her within the nursing facility. So, um, you know, we were kind of wondering what could be the reason why this person who was so highly functional after the fall uh, and that pain in the shoulder completely stopped eating and started having hallucinations. So this is the study that you know I would point to that has been done in acutely hospitalized patients, which shows that, um, so follow me, um, the top line is basically pain during activity. The, the long dashed line is pain during rest. And the dotted line is delirium. So as you see, pain during rest is very closely associated with delirium. Delirium is waxing and waning of mental status, inattention, and you know they could have hallucinations and delusions. So what I'm saying here is what we assessed is after, you know, saying, well, she might have a UTI, you know, people start talking about that. But the actual reason why she was not eating and she was confused is because she was having intense pain at rest. This lady is a 96 year old lady. She just had a fall. The son wants her to be treated within the nursing facility. So we made a decision to treat her for pain. And as we treated her for pain and pain during rest, and once her pain got better control, not with PRN, but with scheduled pain medications, um, she actually woke up and she started eating. 
and she um, stayed with us for a long time um, and had a great quality of life during her stay in the nursing home. So, you know, we talked about the fact that, you know, uncontrolled pain will actually lead to delirium. We always talk about, you know, um, or worry about the fact that, you know, opioid pain medications themselves could cause delirium. Yes, they can cause delirium in, in higher doses or whatever the patients always think of patients tolerance. That's a, that's a moving target, right? So, um, and Dr. Eason is going to go into some of those issues, but um, if the opioid pain medication is too much for a person, they could clearly have delirium, but untreated pain also can lead to delirium. And so you have that small window within which you have to function. So the second part of uh, this equation of what we call opioid stewardship, very similar to antibiotic stewardship, right? You are very familiar with antibiotic stewardship. We're gonna talk about opioid stewardship is how long should we continue these pain medications, right? So we're getting a lot of post, um, uh, post-surgery patients into our long-term care facilities and they are, you know, they are on either pain medications or something, right? And we are always scratching our head, like how long should we continue them on these medications? So this is a beautiful study that was done on a lot. It's a huge number of patients um, that they did. It was in um, the in Annals of Surgery um, and it was recently published. So what they did is they took eight most common surgeries and um, they said, well, we are going to, so on the x-axis, on the bottom axis, they said, um, you know, let's look at what the surgeons wrote the, uh, uh, for how long they, they wrote the prescription for. The, so the surgeons wrote the prescription for one day, two days, three days, that's the bottom number, right? And then the the um, y-axis or the long number is how many people then requested for opi uh, refills of their opioid pain medication. So what you see is if you do it for too short, they are going to request for refills. If you do it for too long, that is too long and they are going to request for, there is that increase in refills as well. You know, common sense tells us that. But in this study, um, it's so elegant. They found the same thing. So when you look at all these curves, what you see is that dip in the middle, right? That dip and the lowest point of that dip is the ideal amount of time that they determined it was to write for a pain prescription. So what does this do? It gives us a little bit of a guardrail into saying, well, if a person and the, um, the bars are basically the very light bars are the general surgery patients. So these are going to be, you know, somebody who had an intra-abdominal surgery. Women's health is the next bar. Up and the darkest bars are the musculoskeletal surgeries. So based upon that, what we have is guardrails. So optimal length in days is for a general surgical procedure is five to seven days. If beyond that, your patient is asking for pain medication, you gotta like figure it out. What is going on? Do they have like some complication of surgery or what may be going on? So that's when you need to really kind of start paying attention to, hmm, this is not going the right way and we need to explore more. Uh, similarly, women's health study, uh, women's health um, uh, surgeries are going to take 10 days and musculoskeletal two weeks, right? So this is another study which kind of gives us the ballpark of where we should be thinking about and beyond which we should really start to think about, you know, how to, when to give the maximum pain medication and how to taper it down, right? So, um, so this was a very well done study. So my approach in long-term care is when we are getting patients, the question that I ask myself is, is there moderate to severe acute musculoskeletal pain at rest? You know, these are post, um, post-surgery patients. If there is pain at rest, then what I'm doing is I am scheduling that pain medication and I'm tapering it, right? 
if there is no acute pain and uh, you know pain at rest then i am giving that prn pain medication but also working with, with my interdisciplinary team with my physical and occupational therapists my nurses and typically uh, now our nursing staff knows so well right the occupational and uh, the physical therapist is going to say we're getting this is so and so uh, for um, therapy in about half an hour, and they will go and they will give that pain PRN pain medication so that the therapy part is effective, right? So we're going to talk about schedule and taper in two seconds, um, or maybe here. Here, when I'm talking about schedule and taper, he, here are a few tips that I will give to you. In older adults, which is a lot of patients that we are seeing, right? Behold the power of that 2.5 of Norco, right? Or very small doses of pain medication. Don't hit people with a hammer. You know, when we get older, we don't need that much pain medication. I will tell you what typically happens. Patient is in the hospital. They are 85, let's say, um, never taken pain medication before. You know, they, they will get surgery. Somebody's going to come. They're going to give them... 10 milligrams of Norco or 10 milligrams of Percocet and the patient is not waking up, throwing up and just hallucinating. And now you have, you have an allergy on the chart and they will never be able to take that medication ever again. So typically schedule and taper, if the person is really, you know, that older adult with osteoporosis, small build, I'm starting with a half a pill of hydrocodone. Um, you know, estaminophen and hydrocodone, scheduling it three times a day if they are constantly having pain and tapering it off. So three times a day for five days, twice a day for five days, bedtime for five days, and discontinue. So this is the kind of schedule that I have. Now you can go up and down on that, right? Depending on how well your, your pain is controlled. Now, this is the other person, um, also a real patient, 78-year-old male admitted recently with MS content 40 BID, dilated two milligrams every four hours as needed. Staff reports that he's irritable, demanding no change in medication. He's also on Xanax, one milligram BID. And by then, by this time, I am freaking out as, as his doctor, right? Because I'm like, oh my God, there's a lot of work to be done. And then Neurontin also at 800 milligrams, Q12 hours. On further history, he has lost his spouse, lives alone, has been approached about cutting down his meds several times recently, and has a short-term memory loss. So he has done this thing over and over where he is really irritated that people talk to him about cutting down his medication. He also has a history of overdose. Lots and lots and lots of red flags. I will let Dr. Azen talk about them in a second, but... Think about this patient. This is our usual patient who's coming in. What are the problems here? He's on MS content and he's on dilated. So he's on polypharmacy with opioids and we don't know which what is doing, right? Second, he is on Xanax. This is a really, really terrible combination of opioids and Xanax. Um, and then he's on a giant dose of Neurontin. The first thing that you need to do when people are on that dose of Neurontin is check their kidney function and check their DFR because they may not be able to handle it. That's what we found, that he was not able to handle this, right? So this is your typical patient that you're going to get. Let's quickly look at this study. And, you know, it's so, so, so important. On the left side is the... Um, out of hospital deaths and then all deaths, you know, top and bottom with no concurrent opioids. So these people are only on benzodiazepine, only on um, what we call Z drugs, which are Sinesta and all these drugs that are older at all patient. And many of the doctors think that are have no side effects, but they do actually. Um, and then trazodone. And so your trazodone is your reference point. So on the left side is you have that um, people who are on these medications without the opioids. The right side is the one with opioids and look what happens. So your baseline is your left side, trazodone, right? And your right side is now you added an opioid. So 
this gentleman maybe was on Xanax, you added the opioid, what just happened? His chances of dying, his hazard ratio went up three times. So, but, so it's a significant increase in mortality, significant increase. Also look at the Z drugs, all these ambience and all these lovely drugs that we think don't do anything cause significant increase in mortality when given with opioids. These, the combination of opioids and your sedative hypnotics, which is your Ativan, Xanax, clonazepam, really bad idea. So you got to like think about it because it's significantly increasing their chance of death. The other thing that I would also say is you start the, we, we are using opioids all the time, but opioid um, induced constipation will happen every time, almost every time you give an opioid. And if you didn't start that medication for opioid induced constipation, then you're always going to be behind. So if constipation already set in and now you're starting the Senna, you will always be chasing it for your entire life, for their entire life. So don't do that, right? When you're starting the opioid, you're going to have to think about what am I going to start, you know, as far as the, um, for a peristalsis, right? Because you are going to have hard stool. You are going to have constipation. You will have to use the laxative proactively. Never use fiber as a laxative. It is going to turn into cement and you're going to have a miserable patient and you're going to be miserable. So that being said, Sana and Miralax or polyethylene glycol, great medication. Relistor and Emetiza are also great, but they cost a lot. So make sure that you are kind of figuring out who is paying for what. But generally, these people will do well with Senna. They will do well with Lactulose. They will do well with Sorbitol. They will do well with Miralax. So think about these considerations when you are giving um, opioid uh, medications. So start laxatives and lifestyle changes, and then consider all you know alternative reasons for symptoms consider opioid tapering this is all when it has set in the constipation has set in and then you need to get to that relistor and emetiza so that's what this um is telling you let me quickly talk about so what one thing before i leave the opioids is the following you don't have to get give too many opioids one thing that we did is very similar to antibiotic stewardship. We just got good at a few opioid therapies. We understood how they work and we work with them because every so often you're gonna have a patient who will need this like esoteric opioid therapy. But we stuck to, you know, increasing the knowledge for, you know, one, one medication, like, you know, let's say hydro, hydrocodone. And we talk to our staff about how it works and, um, and how to go up and down on it. And then it's conversion to let's say morphine. So we got good at morphine. We got good at um, hydrocodone. You just pick the opioid that you, you know, a few opioids, get good at it and try to use them primarily because you know them really well. And, um, and instead of, you know, this person who was who just showed up, right? Who is on dilated and um, and uh, MS content. There is no reason, almost no reason, right? Very rarely patients would need polypharmacy with opioid therapy. So it's very very important to get good at a few and get really good at them, right? So then um, comes the multimodal analgesia, and I'm sure that you guys are looking at this um, and. Um, seeing these um, uh, cases where people are getting discharged on neurontin and discharged on muscles relaxant, and I'm going to zip through it. Here is where what I have to tell you. First of all, similar to the opioid prescription, you have to taper them down in the days that we just talked about, right? You know, seven days, 10 days, and 15 days. These are supposed to be tapered if, they, if patients are coming in for post- surgical use of these medications. Um, 
here is where the problem is. People think that gabapentin doesn't do anything. It does a lot. First of all, I, if you have a hard time maintaining somebody's blood pressure, try tapering the gabapentin down. And suddenly you're going to have this person who you don't have to give support, you know, mitodrin or something supporting the blood pressure. And this person is just feeling much better because they are actually not dizzy all the time. But also gabapentin will increase your chance of delirium. Um, increase of chance of new antipsychotic use, which, you know, antipsychotic. Um, and then also increase in chance of pneumonia. That's what this study showed. Again, large study in older adults. So my point here is gabapentin is not without risks and you have to be really smart about the right dose and tapering them appropriately. Skeletal muscle relaxants, the problem is here. The number of prescriptions that we are writing, the new prescriptions and refills is going up pretty significantly in older adults, right? Is that a problem? Yes, it is a problem. Muscle relaxants can cause increase in fall and delirium. And these problems actually increase with the concurrent use of opioids. So this is something that you need to know. So then what do you have available? Local therapies. Capsaicin is a great local therapy that people are not using enough. Of course, I would not give it on their arms because they're gonna touch their eyes and then we're gonna have a problem. But if you have the lower extremity or covered areas, use that local capsaicin, it's great. Um, the other one is diclofenac gel, amazing. Any kind of arthritis or back issues, use physical therapy. This study basically shows that subsequent use of opioids is really delayed if you actually use physical therapy as a modality. So this is the uh, approach to acute pain in long-term care. Um, and I will just leave it for your consumption because we talked about a lot of it. And here is the choosing wisely. Choosing wisely recommendation is recommendations that are well proven. So the Society of Post-Acute Long-Term Care uh, came out with this choosing wisely recommendation, which basically say don't provide long-term therapy, opioid therapy for chronic non-cancer patients in the absence of clear and documented benefit to functional status and quality of life. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Aizen. So we've already talked about a lot of the risk of chronic opioid use. Um, one of the things that, that really um, comes up when we talk about tapers with patients is reviewing the risk and so that they can buy in on why it's important to do the taper. So after 30 days of continuous use, there's an increased risk of lifelong use. And I think most patients, most residents don't want lifelong use. Um, hyperalgesia is really an issue that I think a lot of us have seen in our skilled nursing patients. Um, up titration of pain meds doesn't help. It's because they have really up titrated most of their pain receptors. So they feel increased pain throughout their body. And um, as you escalate doses, the pain stays at a seven and an eight at all times. So you really don't get improvement. Um, there's also an increased risk of overdose when you have a morphine equivalency of 50. So that's about, that's less than 30 milligrams of oxycodone. Um, and in about 65 milligrams of oxycodone, you're really um, have an increased morphine equivalency and increased risk of, of death. So those are things that are really important to, to residents when they hear that, they, they can easily buy in. And then you want to review all cause death, which we've talked about, increased risk of fractures, increased risk of myocardial infarction, um, the constipation we've reviewed, and then chronic withdrawal in which residents just feel miserable all the time because they're in some sort of withdrawal at all times from the medication. But as you're reducing the meds, you wanna proceed with caution. Um, the pendulum has really swung as far as deprescribing opioids in the last few years, especially in my state of Washington, where we're not allowed to even co-prescribe with benzodiazepines or those hypnotics. Um, but if we go too fast without patient buy-in, then we can actually risk increase their risk of overdose. So if you were to discharge a, uh, a resident into the community with a plan rapid taper of an, um, of an opioid, they are at increased risk of overdose and all, um, overdose and, and, um, all cause deaths. 
um, AMA, CDC, and FDA have issued warnings about over overly um, quickly uh, reducing the opioids. So really, we've got to think about they don't function solely as painkillers. They're they're actually in our human our brains produce their own opioids. And so when we add in opioids from outside, so um, we are actually interrupting the stress modulators that we we naturally make. And so this is what we're seeing in, in residents when they start to have lots of distress about the taper. So um, you want to have buy-in and then educate the resident about the benefits of tapering. And you want to review their goals and make sure that their goals um, kind of coincide with your goals. And then explore the risk of what happens if they were to discharge on opioids, that increased risk of death. Um, it's ideal to reduce about 10% at a time. So if they've been on less than 30 days, you can do that every two to three days. And if it's been greater than 30 days, you probably want to go down um, a little bit slowly, more like every week. Um, and then you just want to keep going back to the resident and reviewing the benefits of tapering and make sure that they're still on board. Um, because if they feel like it's their plan, it will go so much better. Um, and so as you're Tapering, if you start to notice issues, you want to review, review for opiate use disorder. Um, I've talked about this in other talks. There's a loss of control, a social impairment, health impairments. You want to go through this list, which is available in the DSM, and see if they have opioid use disorder. And if they do, that really changes our management. So for opioid use disorder, you want to utilize buprenorphine, methadone, or naltrexone. And there's strong evidence that this will reduce death in these patients. Just stopping their opioids is risky. So um, if they have a dependence on opioids, but not opioid use disorder, then you want to do a slow taper with support. And if they have chronic pain syndrome, say they were on these high doses prior to coming into the facility, at the very least, you want to get them to their previous dose and maybe even taper them further. Ideally, taper them less than 50 morphine equivalents to reduce their risk of overdose. And then if they have opiate use without dependence, you just want to go through this patient-centered plan. Um, buprenorphine is a great option for some patients to transition to because of its lower risk of respiratory suppression, lower risk of overdose. Um, it's a longer acting medication, so it's actually fairly well tolerated and residents do really well with it as far as their chronic pain um, syndrome goes. And it's great um, if they have respiratory issues and if they have a co-occurring substance use disorder like alcohol use disorder, it is absolutely uh, much safer than any opioids. Um, it comes in multiple formulations, Belbuca and um, is, is one of them for, for pain specifically, but Suboxone um, and um, uh, is one of them for opiate use disorder, but can also be used in pain. So opiate stewardship is important for overall health and there's a significant risk of these um, medication. So you want to review those and resident-centered taper plans are best um, and identify residents with opiate use disorder and, and offer them treatment and transition to buprenorphine if possible. Don't have a lot of time for questions, but happy to try to answer any.